Support for Music Money University and the following message are brought to you by TuneCore. Do you want to take your career to the next level and start making money from your music? The good news is all you need is a digital distributor. TuneCore is dedicated to helping independent artists get their music in over 150 digital stores and streaming services in over 100 countries worldwide. And the best part is they never take a cut of the money they collect for you. No label, no catch, no barriers to selling your music worldwide. Take control of your career and get 20% off your first upload on TuneCore by clicking the link in our show notes. Welcome to Music Money University, where you learn in-depth strategies on how real artists, musicians, and entrepreneurs earn a full-time income in the music business. I am your host, Omari, and today on our show, we have Nadeem Mirza, an A&R at Create Music Group. In 2011, Nadim started out in film and TV production in a variety of roles until he made a career switch at the beginning of 2017. He began knowing very little about the music industry and within two years has expanded his knowledge greatly on YouTube rights management, distribution, music publishing, and more. He works with a variety of clientele, including K-pop songwriters David Amber and Sean Alexander, indie hip-hop artists like Futuristic and Sick World, and EDM acts such as Dead Mouse and his label, Mousetrap. Nadim, welcome to Music Money University. Thank you. Glad to be here. Great to have you here. So the company Nadim works for, Create Music Group, was founded in 2014 by his longtime high school friends, Jonathan Strauss and Alexander Williams. CMG has collected $60 million in unclaimed revenue for artists and labels in the past three years. They're the fastest growing music rights management company in the world and fast company named them the seventh most innovative music company worldwide. CMG headquarters are based in Los Angeles and additional offices are in Vancouver, New York, and India. So Nadim, we talked about the $60 million in unclaimed revenue you guys have collected for artists on our show. We like to dive right into the revenue numbers first, because without numbers, you and I are just talking opinions, right? So right. tell us how CMG was able to collect that revenue and the business model behind it so artists listening can understand more about it. Well, basically, um, it wasn't even essentially um, a business model. Well, I guess it, it led to a business model, but first it was an idea. And that idea was basically the uh, that it was that main problem that the music industry was dealing with in the early 2000s, piracy, right? And no one can deny it. Even like uh, me and my friends, we were downloading music at the time too. It was the easiest way to do things, but now things have changed and we've realized the, uh, the damage that piracy has really done. So it was um, basically kind of like uh, acknowledging the fact that uh, there was something we could do about it, especially when YouTube kind of opened up, uh, opened up its doors to uh, companies and creators into individual creators as well to monetize and control their copyrights on YouTube. Uh, but we didn't notice that uh, a lot of people didn't even take that upon themselves to do that. So there was a lot of producers, like EDM producers, um, a lot of uh, hip hop guys putting out mixtapes, all putting that stuff up on SoundCloud or wherever. And they had uh, little to no knowledge of the fact that this stuff was getting ripped, putting up on YouTube, and other parties were monetizing their content for them and collecting that money. So we stepped in and started administering their rights for them. And before we knew it, we were putting uh, money into the, into the pockets of a hip hop and EDM producers like all over the place because we were collecting their money that was being uh, basically exploited on YouTube. So redirecting that revenue, in some cases, those clients were earning $10,000 a month. And uh, there's a handful of them that are still earning 10, 50, even a hundred thousand dollars a month now just from, administering their rights on you know uh, on music they've already put out in the past stuff that's gone viral uh one example in fact many people may not uh or may uh, hopefully will may know about is um a guy named deshaun raw did a uh did a clip called the rap battle parody went super super viral like many years ago and uh once we started collecting on that asset for him it it exploded. Same thing goes for uh, the revenue exploded. And same thing goes for uh, Seventh Element by Vitas, this uh, Russian opera singer. Uh, his 
his song uh, went viral in many memes and online uh, like uh, jokes, uh, joke videos online. And we have a viral team that uh, tracks that stuff down and they're earning anywhere from 10 to $15,000 a month or even $20,000 a month. It all varies. The revenue from YouTube varies based on time of year. Um, you know, the demographic of who's watching uh, all other types of stuff. There's like a hundred different factors that get factored into um, what revenue and what CPMs are going to be on YouTube. But at the end of the day, it started with that. And then it became, re- it, then it became prevalent that um, it wasn't just small time uh, or not even rather small time, but um, independent artists and independent musicians uh, getting their music exploited, but it was the majors as well. And, uh, and yeah, we're just uh, helping out everybody to kind of keep the YouTube roads clear, so to speak. So are you speaking of YouTube content ID when you're talking about administering rights on YouTube? Exactly. So content ID is just like any audio fingerprinting like Shazam. Um, and then with uh, our uh, data intelligence team, we go in a little further and uh, we try to track down the additional uh, the additional videos that have been unclaimed by Content ID. And more often than not, those additional videos, even though they're about 1% of unclaimed videos by Content ID, uh, for the most part from our analytics, we've seen it makes up 65% or more of overall revenue for that particular kind of asset. And that's simply just because, again, going back to the factors that determine what kind of revenue is coming out of a YouTube video, uh, that 1% of videos always seems to be a very high CPM because it's either like uh, mixed compilations or, um, you know, uh, powerful influencer videos, those types of things, because uh, people have been using snippets of songs in the idea that it could be fair use. And really, the Fair Use Act is um, kind of going back and forth between a lot of people. Um, and many people have their opinion about it. But for the most part, a lot of people are, have been kind of using it incorrectly. So when they use it incorrectly, it's just a matter of um, us administering that rights, but also kind of trying to explain to people too, you know, the way fair use works. Gotcha. All right. So you talked about an extra percentage that you catch after YouTube content ID. So is that, I guess, is that like a proprietary part of create music group, like your own technology that catches the extra 1%? Yes, exactly. Oh, okay. Okay. So, you mentioned, you know, you working with Dead Mouse and uh, Sick World, and you know some other artists. Do you yeah. guys reach out to them, or is it more artists reach out to you? Do you just work with bigger artists and labels, or you you kind of work with everybody? We kind of work with everybody. Um, we've been very open to you know accepting any and all type of clientele. Anybody who feels like they need assistance with rights management on YouTube. Uh, we do our best to assist from uh, from the little guys all the way to the big guys. We try to, and all the little girls and big girls too. <laughs> we service um, everybody that we can. And uh, yeah, it pretty much just comes down to when we first start talking to someone, we, we research their catalog and we research their stuff on, like, on YouTube to figure out if there is anything for them to really, really go after. Because when people view just a couple re-uploads of their stuff and they go, hey, I want to that, have that re-administered, I look into it and, you know, uh, it's just like, it's tough for both parties to hear it, but it's just kind of like, yeah, those re-uploads generated probably only an extra like 20, 30 bucks. Do you really want to go through all the effort to go collect that? If it's something that truly is something that we uh, find that we can find value in, I can at least, and the truth is, is I can at least give people some advice, but at the end of the day, uh, we were, we have been really open to accepting everybody, but now we have to be a little bit more analytical just because, um, we're, we don't want to take on too much that we can't handle right now. Um, but at the same time, uh, we find value and we reach out uh, very often. Some of which, in, in some cases, when I first started, in fact, I was cold calling. I was just researching and then going, oh, wow, okay, this artist really looks like they're missing a lot of money. Let me figure out the manager's email. I would email the manager. And uh, more often than not, too, there's phone numbers online as well. So I would pretty much be cold calling people and being like, Hey, how's it going? Nadine here from Create Music Group. I don't suppose you saw my email, et cetera, et cetera. And just trying to start conversations that way. And then now as time has gone on to my uh, network has kind of grown to the point where, um, you know, 
colleagues and associates and clients even um, are referring their friends and uh, their friends and other associates to me. So um, I get emails from people as well now about rights management and all that type of stuff. And so after your proprietary software catches, you know, the extra videos, I guess you guys just contact YouTube and tell them there's like this video or that video. You kind of have a system that oh. lets YouTube know, and then YouTube redirects the money to them. Uh, yeah, basically. Well, actually, in fact, so every, every major company, including all the majors and then even all the, um, even a whole bunch of smaller ones too. Everyone joins the partner network. Um, individuals join the, uh, the creators join the partner, the YouTube partner network. Um, the, or sorry, the YouTube partner program, uh, that allows them to monetize their content. Uh, one level above that is if you're a label, a very large label with a large catalog, um, or a rights administration company, you can reach out to YouTube to get access to a YouTube content management system or a YouTube CMS. And then using that, we administer the rights for people. So it's not necessarily us like going out and reaching out to YouTube. Rather, they gave us the tool that's necessary within their system to administer our rights. So we upload and onboard um, assets for a client, and then we use those assets with reference files that are very, that's just the same thing as like Shazam, right? You just hear the song, and then it uh, tells you what's, what's the name of the song. Um, same thing with ours is, uh, it tracks videos and watches videos and um, and tells us what the name of the songs are in the in the videos and then we uh, we claim those using the YouTube content management system and then it's that system that we get uh, that we collect royalties from for artists. So is this just on YouTube or does your software also work on like Facebook videos, Instagram videos? Uh, when Facebook videos and Instagram videos are ripped from those platforms and uploaded to YouTube. Yeah. Um, but as of right now, the, the subject of Facebook and Instagram, uh, CMSs and like the, the copyright control that you can administer on there. I'm not hundred percent sure about if that's fully capable right now. I know that Facebook does have a CMS system. Um, and, uh, yeah, there is a Facebook CMS, but I don't know the extent of, uh, of what that CMS capabilities are right now. Okay. Yeah, I know. I knew that Facebook did have it. I knew it was nowhere near, uh, you know, YouTube's program. But uh, I do know that, you know, some artists and producers, probably producers more so than artists listening would would want to know like if I upload this to Facebook, can I get the revenue there and so much? And uh, so is it, this is mostly just YouTube based. Yeah. Mostly just YouTube based. I mean, the company started out with, I started out being a YouTube rights management company and uh, now it's expanded into music distribution. Um, a subsidiary company of ours is called label engine. Um, we use that for uh, our distribution services. And then we also have a music publishing department. Uh, which came to light when we signed the Takashi 69 co-publishing deal back in 2018, I'm going to say, or 2017, might even been earlier. I'm not sure when that, when that was, but uh, that was a big deal that kind of opened up the doors to that department. And then um, additionally, another uh, subsidiary is called Flight House. It's a cross-platform brand catered to Gen Z. Um, and uh, their biggest following is on TikTok with 19 million followers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. TikTok keeps, keeps coming up. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's get a bit more into those other fields. How much of those are part of the business? Is it mostly the proprietary software that's the big thing that create music group is known for, or is it um, like, I don't know, 60% of that. And then a good chunk of 20% is the publishing and, you know, another 20% something else. Uh, the, the, the official breakdowns of revenue. Um, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but I can say effectively that the, the rights management services of our company are, are pretty much the bread and butter of our company and music distribution as well. Okay. So let's work our way backwards in a little bit. So we know your numbers, like the company's numbers, um, a little bit of the company's story and 
I, if you no. want, I could give more of the company's story as well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Dive into that. Cool. Yeah. I mean,